love it. I think it looks good now. It's already recording. So, um, I want you just to start, as always, with like, can you say your names and um, what your role here is at this playground? Or? My name is Zoe Portman, and I'm the executive director of Playground NYC. My name is Yoni Kalai. I'm one of the co-founders of Playground NYC and the head player. And what can you discuss the origins of like the junk playground, or what later became called the adventure playground, and um, where it may have started? The idea for like a, an adventure playground. They started in uh, Denmark during World War II. Maybe the one over it's okay. 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 I'm doing the interview, so. Okay, yeah, we'll do it back later. Sorry, go ahead. Adventure Playground started in Denmark during World War II. Uh, with one specific one, which still exists. Uh, the concept traveled to England, where it was the term Adventure Playground was coined. Uh, traveled to many places in the world, uh, basically noticing that the kids were playing more, or they had more control over things, and rubble of the ruins, or something like that, rather than a fixed equipment playground. Yeah, but there were there was a, Lady Allen's the one who coined the term adventure playground, correct? Yeah. And um, but the, these junk playgrounds. Oh, I bet you, like, these were actually designed spaces versus just a uh, bombed out building. The first adventure playgrounds were actually designed specifically by uh, a designer, correct? Can we talk about maybe those, like the, in Denmark, those first adventure playgrounds, the initial ones? Um, and who's the it designer? It was built as part of a housing project. Um, I wasn't there, but... Yeah. <laughs> I don't expect to be an expert, but like I always like to find out like a little of the history, if as much as somebody may or may not know. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, at a real bombed out site, you're going to run into hazards, which you don't want to be crossing. Unexploded ordinances, uh, broken glass, I don't know what, uh, an unstable structure here. Kids are building structures which potentially are unstable, but the play workers are here around all the time and we are checking the situation, making sure that we are allowing for risks to be available but eliminating hazards. Oh, it's not ours, yeah. It's not ours though. Go take them play with them. Okay. And what is what is play? Yes. That's a very big question. Yeah. <laughs> In the playwork world, we say that play is a set of behaviors that are freely chosen, intrinsically motivated, done for their own sake. Um, but it's it's very hard to define. Well, okay. Do you think that freedom of choice is an important part of play? And, and, and we talk about that and why maybe these adventure playgrounds offer that freedom of choice and, and, and sense of adventure? Well, children are being blocked in a big way, like controlled what to do, how to do, when to do, don't do this all the time in society, at least modern societies in the Western world. Um, that is really detrimental. And we're trying to go against that and say that we are trusting them. We're giving them the freedom to be in charge of their time decisions. And, you know, everyone just likes to say that it's okay to, for a baby to learn how to walk and they might fall on the way. But soon after, it's not really okay for them to make mistakes. They're being graded, being told not to do things, we try to give them as much freedom as we can. And, and so Venture Playgrounds were more popular in Europe, but less so in the United States. And uh, and this is the only Venture Playground in New York. Do you have any 
insights into why maybe it was more popular in European countries and in England and Denmark versus the United States? <laughs> <laughs> I do want to add that there used to be more adventure playgrounds in New York City. Uh, there was one in the Bronx in Mauritania in the 70s. There was one in East Flatbush also in the 70s. Um, so there was a time when there was more support for this type of play. Um, I think it's a combination of lack of funding. Uh, the playground is staffed at all times. So I think there's the idea that it costs more than fixed equipment, which debatable. Um, also, fear of litigation. I think we live in a society where that's very risk averse and not prone to handling these conversations very uh, with nuance. <laughs> um, and then the culture of parenting, I think, in the U.S. that's um, very individualistic and almost professionalized, where we think parents have to be all these things. Um, so the idea of letting your kids just explore on their own has been declining. Okay. Is, is, do you think that um, that's the, the danger factor of, do you think that uh, adventure playgrounds are any more dangerous than any uh, other playground? I mean, you're talking about a staff playground with playground staff, like monitoring. Um, I mean, how, is, it, is that a concern that parents should have it, about their, their child getting hurt or the danger factor? I would say that it's, it's not more dangerous. Uh, uh, school in uh, Houston, Texas did an actual study on their regular playground and on their adventure playground. And they found a lower number of injuries where they had to go to the nurse or the hospital at the adventure playground. And even some of the injuries on the adventure playground were totally unrelated to the fact that it was an adventure playground like slipping on the grass, which could happen on any playground. Um, so, no, they're not more dangerous, but because you can see the danger, and the risk in a different way, then the parents are afraid, but they forget that the kids also see that risk and that they adapt their behavior when they have things that they're interested in doing They'll do that at the normal playground where they climbed it a thousand times and it's no longer interesting for them. They start doing things that they're not actually designed to be doing and that's where you're going to get hurt. And why should a parent consider bringing a child to an like, adventure playground versus a conventional one? I think we've kind of talked a little bit about this, but in that context of that question. Um, Normal playgrounds are really good at giving space for gross motor skills, some interaction with other kids, and that's kind of it. Uh, we cater to a much wider range of play options or play types, as we say in the playwork world. So we have costumes for dress up, we have tools for building or breaking things if somebody wants to take apart a old speaker and see the inside of it. They could do that. Um, kids often are so excited about swinging on a swing that they made, even though it's much less of a, an exciting swing as far as how far you can push it compared to the normal one. But it's a lot more interesting because it's different. It's new. There's a real pull for new things for us human beings and we want to be in control of the environment affect it see how it affects us uh, did, where did the idea come to build an adventure playground on governor's island Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um we were not when we started playground we were looking in the boroughs mostly in brooklyn um we were doing pop-up events city parks. We had a space that we were thinking about in Bushwick, um, but then they, basically the Trust for Governors Island approached us to do a pop-up event on the island. We accepted and from that the conversation grew to maybe actually have a permanent playground here. 
were pleased about. Uh, how has a community, the New York City community, and, and also the world at large, because it's a lot of tourists come to Governor's Island also and bring their kids, how, how, have, they, how have they responded to this adventure playground? That's yeah, a, a great <laughs> response. Uh, people love it. Um, I'll say from the downside of things, we're not in the community. We're not in the neighborhood. Yeah. Which is our challenge. And we recognize that we don't serve all of New York City as much as we would like to. But we want to actually be able to get into neighborhoods in the city. Yeah. So does this sort of serve the world versus like serves the city, but do you find that there is still a community there here that comes here and supports you? I think there are people, there are families who come almost every weekend each summer, so there are families who've made this completely part of their family lives, but I think we recognize that Governor's Island is accessible from a certain number of neighborhoods in New York City, um, and, you know, it's still sort of a destination. Most families wouldn't send their kids alone to the island, you still have to take your kid on the ferry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, that's also one of the difference with the adventure playgrounds in Europe, which tend to be more integrated in the neighborhood where there might be relationships that form between the play workers and neighbors and a sense of sort of intimacy in the neighborhood where you might start letting your kid walk alone to the adventure playground and see them every day instead of just on the weekend. And um, uh, what made you want to get involved into like did this kind of play and to create an adventure playground? And to start playground in the first place. What was important to have something like this? I was uh, in general looking for work with kids and something. I was looking at play therapy, um, movement therapy, all sorts of things. And then I stumbled across the article in the Atlantic, uh, the overprotected kid or child, I can't remember. Um, and the documentary about the land and adventure playground in Wales. I just rang true and I, and I then I found that Alex and Eve who had already done the pop up and were starting to create playground and I joined them. Yeah. Um I think I came to it through my kid. I'm a mom. I had a one-year-old at the time, um, and I would take her to playgrounds around the city that more or less look the same everywhere. You know, it doesn't matter if you go at the one, to the one at the end of your block or to a new neighborhood. They sort of have the same fixtures, same colors, rearranged differently. But um, and because I let her explore playgrounds, I very quickly noticed she was getting bored. Um, she would, you know, go on the swings a little bit and go on the slides a little bit. And then I sort of found myself with this like conundrum where she, I was like facing a one-year-old who should have been the prime user of a New York City parks playground and was bored on the equipment. Um, so I just sort of became interested in why that was and where the design flaw was. <laughs> um, and sure enough, now she refers to this playground as the fun playground and the other playgrounds as the <laughs> There are some good fun playgrounds in New York, but you do have to uh, seek them out. No, there have been great playgrounds that have been made across the city. Even like across what they did with like the Battery playscape. Park playscape great. is fantastic and we actually rely on it for uh, some of our work. Um, unfortunately, some of the better playgrounds seem to be in either sort of neighborhoods or public-private partnerships. They're public-private partnerships because um, they have funding. So we also hope that the yard can sort of be like a proof of concept for what playgrounds around the city could be. Uh, we recognize that not every neighborhood going to have access to something like that, you know. But there are things I think the Parks Department and the city at large could learn from what I mean, I saw you guys there. like were in Williams Beach Oval, right, as well. So you go to the Bronx and different boroughs and have these pop-ups, right? Yeah, I think these pop-ups also help having to have this conversation on what play could look like um, and sort of diversifying the type of play we offer to New York City kids. Um, the pop-ups tend to cater to younger kids or kids who may not quite be sure about the yard yet because of the type of materials we can offer at pop-ups, which are um, sort of more based on cardboard boxes and strings and tape. And, um, but they do rely on the same philosophy of letting the kids uh, self-direct their play. You okay, Davis? 
Um, and when when can people visit like the yard, and, and what are the rules? They're open for the public uh, Saturday and Sunday, twelve to four. The rule is uh, try to have fun, not hurt yourself or others. Yeah, there's you know, people at the. Sign a release, right? And it's parents, we kids only. We require a waiver to be signed for. We appreciate donations, but it's totally free. Close their shoes. Close their shoes, correct. <laughs> if you don't have them, we have them for you. And where does all this junk come from? Uh, streets of New York City have so much stuff that we find. The Materials for the Arts is a great resource that we got tons of things from individual families and organizations that have uh, donated. So if somebody has something, uh, some wood or some old planks or something, or a tube or something, they could bring it to you and donate it to you guys? Yeah, it's good to get in touch first uh, to make sure that it actually is the right fit. And also there's a logistical difficulty of getting stuff to the island. So... If you get in touch, we might be able to figure it out better than if you try to log it, lug it on your own uh, onto on the, the ferry. ferry. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what? How does this playground accommodate younger children? So this year we brought back the family play area, which is to the left when families enter the yard. Um, it provides some smaller structures um, or shorter structures that toddlers um, might have better access to. We also ask that caregivers or parents enter the family play area with their kids. Um, so kids that are five or under usually start there, or families that are new to the yard usually start there, so they can also get a feel for it before their kids cross over to the main area. Uh, we have a big sandbox over there, water play, um, and also uh, a variety of loose parts. And how, is there like interaction with uh, maybe children with disabilities, physical disabilities and learning disabilities? Does this play on accommodate them? And do you, is there any involvement with that? We welcome everyone. Um, and because of the very changing nature of this playground, um, we don't have something that is built that is for wheelchairs. But we have paths that are clear, and if the path isn't clear, then the kids and us play workers are there to help clear the way if that's needed. Um, sometimes uh, kids who might need closer attention, uh, that uh, we make exceptions to allow the parents to come in with them with some guidance from us. Uh, where most kids, their parents are not allowed in to the main play area. Um, but yeah, we adjust and adapt. Um, and I'll say that uh, we've found that a lot of kids who are labeled with ADHD and autism and all sorts of things, the kids who struggle at school or all sorts of fixed uh, settings actually thrive with us. Okay. Well, we have a few questions. So, um, what skills do that that do adventure playgrounds offer children? By you know, what kind of skills can they develop by utilizing these facilities? Everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that question is, is interesting and obviously they're learning things on the yeah. adventure playground. We try not to think of it as a learning experience. Everything else in their life is a learning experience. Uh -huh. We try to protect play just for play. The play experience. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think once you start talking to children about what they're learning here, it just starts not to be play anymore. Yeah. Um, but you're right. There's no I think doubt. unconsciously they're learning. <laughs> of course. And there's no doubt that's happening and there's no doubt most parents see it. Um, I think, you know, most kids who enter this playground don't know each other and sometimes they need to find another friend to like move a big piece of equipment or a big piece of wood. So they have to 
learn how to navigate these sort of social situations, awkwardness, <laughs> approaching someone you don't know, collaboration. Um, they have to, I mean, they, they end up learning how to manage their own risk tolerance and what they're capable of and their boundaries. Um, I mean, whatever you want, it, it's a question of what the kid wants to do. So if you want to learn how to use tools, you could do that and get really good at it. And maybe you just want to feel a saw and it's not interesting for you anymore. And that's totally fine. Uh, we have options for music, for building, for costumes, for playing with water, with mud. Uh, all of the different social interactions in so many ways. Um, your own personal boundaries, the boundaries of other kids, the boundaries of the play workers that you're interacting with, being outside in the weather, question of like, what do we do if it's raining? Well, we get wet. Uh, there's so many things. I think the age mixing is also something that not a lot of kids get to experience at school, right? You're sort of with your class, and that happened at recess a little bit, but here we might have kids who are five and kids who are 13, and sort of having to navigate that. Is there a favorite, I, I know this is probably a cliche question, my question, some of them are a little cliche, sorry, <laughs> but um, what, do you have a favorite thing about the yard? Or it can be, it doesn't have to be a thing, it can be a happening or something, an experience. For me, it's just seeing the, seeing, hearing, experiencing the joy of so many kids and even so many adults that just pass by and don't enter. They see glimpses of it and you can see how it moves people. They see a something that is real, that is not cookie cutter, that things can be different. There is room to imagine, to believe. Um, for me, that's the most important thing. All of that, <laughs> but uh -huh. also, I have a soft spot for the, our mud pit, which is behind us and very dry today because it's extremely hot. Yeah. But um, I think being at the yard, as Yoni kind of mentioned, brings you back to a lot of like how you played as a kid uh, and what was the most fun for you. Um, I grew up going to this beach where the tide would go up and down and we build canals uh, with the water going down like all day. And so the mud pits and the kids digging canals over there are sort of my soft spot at the yard. <laughs> I think like in New York, you don't have it. Like I grew up also like building stuff and getting drunk in my backyard. We built forts and dig holes because you had a backyard. You had that space. You know, this is Southern California, but like here in New York, you don't have yards and stuff. So maybe this is also, it gives people like that experience to like have to play in the dirt, to build stuff that you might have done at home if you had that space at home to do that. Yeah, we have a lot of parents who come in and say, oh, I had a yard and a garage, and you know, I would build stuff with my dad, like kind of what the kids experience here. But I think there is a difference between your backyard, which is still your private space for your family, and sort of organizing this stuff and playing the public space when kids can meet each other. Um, and you've mentioned the pop-ups we do, and that's sort of also part of that conversation, right? When kids could meet each other on the block, when the, if you were able to close your block, to not have as many cars, and playing the space with your community versus being in your backyard with just your siblings. And why are, are parks and playgrounds so important to a community? Well, to continue <laughs> what Zoe was saying, when you're in your house, you're with your family, and there isn't a community, really. Um, if we're just walking by each other on the street, on the way to work, or buying groceries, interactions tend to be more basic, and there's less connection. But when we are playing, when we are in recreation in some form, there's more of an opening to connect with each other, and I think that's a big place of where we build community. And I think there's something to be said about the inter 
generational sort of interactions that happen in parks in New York City and beyond. Um, and when families are sort of at the playground behind the fence, it's a very family oriented space. But when you have a park where play can happen, you know, in front of different generations, there's community building that happens differently, I think. The, um, like that's really like all the questions that I formulated yeah. ahead of time. Um, <laughs> but do you have anything that you guys want to express or say or in relation to play or to, to the yard or playground? In general? I think you may want to say something about play workers. The role of play workers. Yeah, because it, <laughs> it used to be like, we are talking about it's like adventure playground, the adventure style playgrounds in Central Park. Play workers were built into that model, like initially, mm -hmm. you know, you, and you had play workers in a lot of New York City parks prior to like, uh, like the 60s or whenever when there was budget cuts and stuff, right? They were a common factor at play. Yeah. So yeah, I'd love to hear about that. Uh, adventure playgrounds cannot operate without play workers, um, and play workers can operate without adventure playgrounds. It's important to remember. Uh, we can bring our work into different settings, um, but really the work of supporting children's play, um, prioritizing their play, prioritizing children's rights, seeing them as complete human beings that have the right to direct themselves um, is really important. And unlike the doctor who's trying to look at all of their health issues and the teacher who's trying to teach them certain things, we are there seeing the kids as they are, supporting them with what they want to be doing. Um, and from that, there's huge growth and connection and um, things that you can't measure so much, um, but that leave a huge impact. I think some people might be walking by the yard and look at this as like a free-for-all, but the level of engagement and awareness um, that the play workers deploy on the playground to assess risk, manage risk, support the kids, um, I think is unbelievable. You know, we always get people who are like, why don't you stay open until six or seven? And <laughs> I think part of it is because like four hours in the playground is an intense job. It's already, you know, you have dozens of kids that come in and out, dozens of different variety of play and play frames that interact with each other. Um, some kids need one-on-one -on -one attention, some don't, and there's just uh, a lot of work that goes into it. We don't just let the kids run wild in the air. And what, what do you, uh, maybe I'll come with one more question. What is the future for, you think, for adventure playgrounds and for playground for the owner? What do you guys see as like, you want to see, you said you want to see more of this in more places in New York City and around the world? I would like to see a future where um, adventure playgrounds are much more the norm. That when a neighborhood has a playground, it's an adventure playground. It has people from the neighborhood as play workers with the kids, it's long-term relationships, and that we are really prioritizing play and the young people, uh, respecting them. And in a way, it's a community center. Um, if we can invest uh, in play, in young people, in education, instead of the things that get a lot of funding um, will create a lot more harmony and peace. Uh, and, you know, we, we see so much hurts actually on the playground. People acting towards each other in hurt, hurtful ways. But that's just because that's what they see in society and they kind of bring it forward again and again, if we focus on 
respectful behaviors and caring for each other, we'll see less of the hurts that are being transmitted from one to the other. I think at one point we'd love for the yard to be open year round. More kids <laughs> all year round. Um, we'd love to have a second location. I think it's no secret now that we're uh, embarking on a search for a second location. Um, ideally serving other neighborhoods than the ones we see showing up on the islands. Um, and ideally ingrained in a space that would be part of a neighborhood in a way that's not a business. Like almost like what they would do, what used to happen with pocket playgrounds, like maybe find like an old abandoned site that yeah. or, or, or transforming a current existing park into I think we're thinking of an empty lot there's so many empty lots in the city actually when you start uh, looking at that um, even if it's a lot that someone might build on in a couple of years I mean the nature of adventure playgrounds is kind of very flexible so we could be there for two or three years um, I think we're looking at doing more work with schools. Uh, we hope that there might be some parents or educators that walk by this place and are inspired enough to prioritize play at home, in their neighborhood, in their schools, um, and doing more pop-ups so we can serve more children around the city. That's all I have. I, I, I mean, I think I was really good, and I appreciate it. Um,